So everybody, we have an absolute treat in store for you all today. We have all of these amazing panelists that will be talking all about the uh, building for the early career. So we have Louise from Google. We have Laura from Spotify for Artists. We have Heather from Figma here. We have Anna, also a product designer, senior director of product design at Slack, and uh, Becca from an art director at Ghost Note Agency. So we have a few questions for them. I'm going to be moderating. I'm super excited. Let's kick this off. And we're going to be kicking this off by having all of our panelists talk a quickly about their career paths. So I'm going to kick it off. I'm going to start with Becca, since you're uh, just beneath me in the little Zoom window here, at least from my perspective. Uh, let me know a little bit about your career path so far and, and what you do now. Thanks, McGee. Um, I'm Becca. I uh, originally grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, so I actually didn't really have a ton of access to design as a, as a child. Um, and I started studying design. Um, I went to New York to study design at St. John's University. And my first job was actually at uh, very, uh, my first like gig, I should say, was kind of like creating social media posts for this like bakery in Queens. And it was very amateur, just trying to get any type of experience. Um, and it was definitely underpaid, overworked, um, and, you know, just trying to get my foot in the door. Um, I eventually was able to get a, an actual internship at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And that was really the first time that I was in a professional role. And just like the warmth and respect of like being on a team, learning uh, and kind of being a sponge really set me up uh, for my next job. I worked uh, as a designer at Compass, that's a real estate agency in New York. Um, I ended up leaving the U.S. after I studied there um, and I ended up in Argentina, where I am now. Um, for an agency called Media Monks. So I worked at Media Monks for three years as a production designer. I got a promotion to senior production designer and then uh, design lead of my team. Um, and during the pandemic, I left that role. And now I'm an art director at Ghost Notes. So it's been really just a journey. And um, I'm excited to see where the rest of my career goes. <laughs> Thank you, Becca. That was amazing. I really love just like all the details in that journey, like just like working your way through it all. Uh, next up, we have Laura. Would you like to share a little bit about your journey? Of course. Um, so yes, I'm Laura. I'm originally from Virginia and I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, mostly because I saw it in a movie and I was like, I like that character. I'll go there. <laughs> um, but I went to school and I was pre-law, but I really liked writing. So I would do a lot of um, journalists uh, efforts. I would do some like reviews, but I fell in love with copywriting because I would do flyers for every club that would allow me to do it. And that's kind of how I was introduced to like copywriting and micro copy and just the whole world of that side of design. Um, but again, I didn't really know that like design was a thing or even that Spotify was a thing. So I saw a flyer one day in the science uh, department and it said, when a free trip to New York, if you go to Spotify. And I was like, free, I love that word. So I signed up for it and I went to Spotify to do a conference. It was called the opening act. And that's where I was introduced to not only UX writing, but the design discipline as a whole. Um, and you would think, oh, Laura went to Spotify. That means she just got straight into design, but that is not what happened. I did intern at Spotify, but I went back to school and I decided I'm going to be a teacher. So my first professional job was teaching English and reading to um, fifth and eighth graders in Brooklyn, New York. And that transitioned into a part-time job at Spotify being a copy editor. And now to the job that I'm in now, which is a UX writer at Spotify on the Spotify for Artists product. Thank you. That was amazing. I too uh, uh, have been a teacher in my journey. So I totally like respect uh, kind of like that pivoting in and out. So um, next up we have Heather Tompkins uh, from Figma. So if you want to let us know a little bit about you. Oh yeah. Um, hi everyone. I'm Heather currently designing at Figma on the community team. Um, I also did not have a straightforward path into design. I actually got my undergraduate degree in film and television from Savannah College of Art and Design, or SCAD. Um, and I worked in film and TV for a number of years. So I was in my like mid to late 20s and was not making enough money, could not cut it in San Francisco, couldn't pay my rent. So I started freelancing as an illustrator. And I was like, well, maybe I could just get hired full time as an illustrator. And no one would hire me full-time as an illustrator. So they were like, well, can you make websites? And I was like, 
Man, enough people have asked me this question in interviews that I feel like I should just figure out how to learn, you know, go back to school and like learn how to make websites, which is what I did. So I went to graduate school at Academy of Art in San Francisco um, in, and I got a, a degree in web design and new media. And then I actually had uh, one of my favorite professors there recommended me for the Kleiner Perkins Fellowship um, right as I was graduating. And I applied to that and that and I got it in 2013. And that was how I landed my first um, actual design job. Um, and I was working for a company called Clout, which no longer is around. And <clears throat> from there, you know, I met my first um, my first manager and mentor, uh, Dave, who's a wonderful uh, human, and I'm still very close with him. And um, I actually ended up following him to my next job, which was Oslo. It was a very small startup. I think there were like eight or nine people when I joined that, and that got acquired. And then ended up joining DIY.org, uh, and I was designing um, uh, I was designing a, a like a social network, like creative social network for kids. And that was super fun. And then that got acquired um, by Little Bits and then Little Bits got acquired by Spiro. And then I um, and then I uh, tapped Zach, my then manager on the shoulder and he got me a, an interview at um, Figma. And I had actually used Figma for a long time um, because I had used it to teach. So Dave, my first manager mentor had um, looped me into teaching at Stanford. And so we were using Figma to teach, you know, since like 20, 16 or so. Um, and so I knew Dylan because he was also in the Kleiner Perkins uh, program. And so, you know, I got um, I got hooked up with him and then started interviewing at Figma. And that's how I ended up here. So if uh, if Adobe uh, buys Figma, then it'll be my fifth acquisition. <laughs> and that's kind of how early startups go, I guess. Oh, that's amazing. I was sitting there. I was counting the acquisitions. I was like, look at one yeah, after the lot. next. Uh, <laughs> I remember clout and I was a fan of little bits. I remember like purchasing those sets for my, my younger siblings. So yeah. uh, that's amazing. All right. Next up, uh, I'm going to pop it over to Anna. Great. Thanks, Maggie. Hi, y'all. I'm Anna. Um, I'm based in the Hudson Valley of New York, um, but I started my career with a degree in graphic design from the University of North Texas, which is a small, wonderful town in Denton, Texas, um, and I moved to New York with the assumption that graphic, that yeah, go mean green, <laughs> graphic design was my career path. Um, so I kind of started working out at a, like a temp agency for design as a freelancer to have a stable income. And I kind of just did like anything I could get my hands on. So I did deodorant packaging, uh, Broadway show posters, websites, of course, a lot of side shows, a lot of presentations, and a lot of banner ads. I designed thousands of banner ads. Um, but eventually I landed my first like kind of career job at an agency called Big Human. Uh, it was a product design studio. And at the time I didn't even really know what product design was, um, but thankfully it kind of became my entire career and what I really loved. So I was very lucky. Um, and right now I'm a design director at Slack and I lead the team who works on new products there, specifically designing tools for remote teams as the world kind of shifted to being digital first during the pandemic. And I've worked there for about five and a half years. And before that, I worked at Tumblr, uh, kind of focused on mobile design, which was one of the first social platforms for creativity and self-expression online. So yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Big Tumblr lover here. Also spent so much time on my early career making banner ads, uh, flash banner ads. Uh, so I totally feel that. You learn so much doing that, by the way. All right. And then lastly, we have Louise. Uh, let us know what you've uh, been up to and how you got here. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, I moved to the US when I was 21 and mostly just worked in like the service industry. So I don't really have the like design like degree background. Um, and I would work for like small businesses and like galleries and just like interesting things in New Orleans when I first moved here. And I had learned to code when I was younger. Like I, I knew a little bit of like HTML front end stuff. And so I would like help with like websites and things like really, really basic stuff. And then over time I was like, oh, I can, I can kind of like do a little more design stuff here. Like, you know, I think I learned Illustrator, like someone told me Illustrator. And I was like, well, this is, I guess this is interesting stuff. You can do this job pretty stoned. And I thought it was really like interesting <laughs> to do something that wasn't retail, that wasn't like bartending or anything like that. And I worked at a gallery that were 
trying to build a website so they could sell like their beautiful art online. And I made a little portfolio over time of helping them with that. And then an agency took pity on me and hired me, <laughs> which I think even now is still very generous of them. And the rest is history. I just got hired at different agencies over time and uh, like worked my way through that sort of like career trajectory up into Google, which uh, is really nice now because I work as a design advocate. And so a lot of the time I talk about like having a little bit of a different journey and getting here via like, there's so many different ways you end up in design, right? This is what we're doing here at this panel. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting journey, but it's been fun along the way. Thank you so much for sharing. That's that's amazing. Yeah, uh, I, I love like the titles because uh, at Figma, I'm a designer, designer advocate and design advocacy. Like I just, I love that whole advocacy you know, like uh, title structure and like how that works and what we get to do. Um, cool. So we're going to move on to the next section. So uh, for each section, we're not going to have everybody answer these. So I'll be be calling you out um, as we move through. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of those stories that kind of brought us to where we are. So I'm going to uh, uh, ask Becca first, we're going to bring it back to you. Uh, what was your first design role? And, and, the biggest lesson that you like learned at that role? Yeah, um, I had mentioned that I worked at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York. And for those who aren't familiar, it is a performance arts venue. Um, they have many stages and they often do uh, different performances. And uh, a lot of my work there was centered around um, creating kind of graphics for the, the, the programming. So it was the first kind of I was going to an office, I was showing up every day, uh, working a nine to five, and I had a really beautiful team that was so supportive um, of me being an intern there. Um, and you know, the first kind of tasks that I worked on were very simple. They were like, silhouette, silhouette these artists and then put them on the background. And I would spend hours just like, this was back in like 2016. So this was like before Photoshop could just do select subject cut out. I was there like masking out people's hair and all of their curls, uh, very painstakingly. So I learned a lot, a lot, a lot about production work and a lot, um, a lot about the details that go into making work uh, between, you know, work that just looks good and work that looks great. It's the devil is in the details. Um, and so that really gave me a, a very attentive eye for design and kind of thinking through how I can apply that uh, very specific uh, attention to detail to projects in the future. That's amazing. Uh, I love that, you know, you you had that time in, in Photoshop and having to do those little details. And, and it's so interesting. It's a rite of passage. Too. Yeah, it's a rite of passage. <laughs> it's and, a rite and, of and passage. how much it informs the way that you perceive and you work in design, like uh, even now, just with these details. So um, Anna, I know that you mentioned the uh, Broadway show posters. Um, would love to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's actually, it's so similar to what uh, Becca was just talking about. But yeah, as I mentioned, one of my first like temp jobs was like production design for Broadway show posters, which had like a very lasting effect on me. Um, kind of at the time, like earlier in my career, I was super interested in like type design and lettering as a career path. And something that I, I learned is that like a lot of these theater companies commonly hire lettering artists. Um, you'll probably notice there's a lot of custom type. If you like look at the New York City subway and see the, the different shows that are going on. So it felt like kind of a good place to make connections in the industry. And I did a lot of like retouching, resizing and like true production work. And it was, it's funny, like reflecting or looking back on it, because the aesthetic was like so different than anything that I do now. It's like sparkles and effects and like shadows and lighting. Um, but what it taught me the most and what kind of carried throughout my career was this like incredible attention to detail of all of the work. So form, color, composition, layout, like how much all of that together really impacts like the overall quality of the design and how much effort and care and practice it takes to design something really, really well that like goes out into the world. And I think, I mean, that's true of like all sorts of design and certainly like relevant to the design practice I have now even designing at Slack, so. Awesome. Uh, yeah, like I love like 
all those details, all those like little intangibles, right? They like really kind of build us up to be the people that we are and, and being entrenched in those details and having to work on that production, it matters so much. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next question now and we're gonna get to the part where we're gonna be sharing some advice. Um, I'm gonna kick it off with Louise. Uh, Louise, what would you share uh, for someone early in their career um, how to build their own path in the world. And, and what's what's great is I love how every single one of the paths that, that y'all have shared here today have been so, so unique. So I'd love to know uh, what advice you would give. I think it's really interesting because we're, we're sort of seeing a lot of movement in the tech industry and design industry right now. And so I think it's quite like timely to talk about like access and getting into the design world. Um, one, really important thing that worked for me was uh, paying attention to what my brain naturally sort of like was drawn to. Like very early on, I was really interested in motion and like animation and things like that. Now that's not like the core of the work I do, but it was something that my brain was able to pick up really quickly. And so I had like experimented with After Effects, was playing around with that. And around the time that uh, motion graphics got really, really popular. I'm thinking back like four or five years ago. It meant that uh, my career got a bit of a boost because I had this like niche specific skill. And so like staying attentive to the things that you naturally like are drawn to and keeping those skills in the, in the hopper, I think are really useful because again, like it meant that I was able to say like, oh, actually if you have work going on, I'm actually really good at this. And it gave me a little bit more opportunity um, versus if I just had kind of like a regular skill set and wasn't quite so like, uh, like, like skilled in that specific talent. So yeah, yeah, I recommend just really paying attention to what, what your brain loves. That's such a good, it's a, such a good tagline. It's like what your brain loves. Uh, I also think that just those other little talents that you may have or other things that you pick up, like even if you're like a career changer, you know, like what else can you provide? Like bring in your whole self, whole self uh, to the discipline. Uh, with that, I'm going to have Laura. Laura, what kind of advice do you have for folks building their own path? Yeah, I think whenever you go to panels like this or discussions like this, you always have the phrase of like the path is not linear or you talk about like transferable skills. But I think an essential understanding in that is like, yes, the path is not linear, but every step on that path like matters. Um, so I would say if I could talk to someone like early in the journey is understanding that the skills that are happening in the career that you're in now will definitely show up in the next career. Hopefully that is a design one. Like there are so many things that I discovered when I was writing, uh, when I was being a journalist that helped me ultimately create lessons when I was a teacher. And the way that I, like the way I taught those fifth and eighth grade girls show up almost every day as a UX writer at Spotify with education, how I create guidance for artists, how I think about how design should be developed, how I think about targeting, and then ultimately how I give feedback. So just understanding that, um, it's not just a step that'll get you to the next step that'll get you to the next step. Understanding that the things that you're learning and the lessons that you're learning in this section are very valuable and um, taking note of that and then also using them to your benefit because we, I used to tell my students uh, for feedback, glow and grow. Like, what are some things that glow for you? And what are some things in this essay that you need to grow from? I use that exact same phrase in my interview at Spotify, and that's what they took away. So just understanding that all of these things work to a greater picture. And like, if you don't necessarily have the path now, that doesn't mean that it's like the end of it. That's great. Uh, every step matters and glow as you grow like I'm gonna have that emblazoned you know like above my desk I love it um Heather do you have anything that you would like to add to the mix sure um yeah sort of speaking from my own experience and career so far um I guess my advice would be um to try to get as much experience at different um at different size and different phases of companies as you can. So I this is, I was not very good at this when I was in grad school. I didn't do a ton of internships. Um, and then when I started my career, you know, Clout, you know, as a company was about 75 people. And then I went from there to a company that was 10 people. And then from there to a company that was 15 people. And so I had all these very small companies 
that I was working with. And it might be surprising to, to know, but there are things that I've done at Figma that I've never done at any other job just because they weren't required. There are relationships or, and sort of thought partners that I've worked with at Figma that I've never worked with on, on, you know, other jobs, you know, before. So for instance, you know, Figma was the first time that I had worked with a UX writer. It was the first time that I had worked with an actual PM. Uh, it was the first time that I'd worked with a data scientist or a dedicated researcher. Um, and so these kinds of things were not available at these smaller companies because they were so small that they didn't require them. And it was sort of like everybody was all hands on deck. So I got a lot of great sort of generalist um, experience, but I, I didn't have those other thought partners to learn from, you know, because they all are, you know, have gone deep into their their areas of expertise. And it has been so fundamental um, for my own learning to work with those partners at a larger company. So Figma is actually the largest company I've ever worked at. And so one thing, you know, if I had to do over, I had to give advice would be, you know, early on in your career, whether it's through internships or through the, the selections of jobs that you take early on, like try to get a breadth of jobs because you're going to learn um, you're going to learn very different things. If you're at a large company working with different um, uh, you know, a larger array of disciplines, you're going to, then you are going to learn at, you know, a small company of 10 people where you're really hustling um, and getting to kind of dip your toes into everything from, you know, you're doing the marketing, you're doing the product, you're doing the email campaign, you're doing all that stuff. Um, so that would be kind of my advice is like, you know, if you can try to get a breadth uh, of experience to kind of see, um, you know, what works for you. Some people don't like very small companies. Some people uh, don't love very large companies. And then to also just kind of see what's out there and to learn um, much faster, I think, than I did some of the things that I'm now learning at Figma. Cool. Yeah. Like, I, I love how, like, so much, so much of this is just kind of, like, resonating, you know, like, uh, it's like what your brain loves, but also, you know, it's like, listen to yourself. Like, if you're in the environment, know what it is, what type of places you want to work with uh, and work at. Uh, so we're going to take it on to our next question. I'm going to kick this one off once again with uh, with Becca. Uh, so the question is going to be the mindsets or practices that you found valuable that helped you uh, in building your your design career. So what is what is that mindset that folks should kind of find themselves in? Um, I really love this question um, because I have quite recently started becoming much more conscious of my mindset, um, and I have two of them. So. One, well, I, I would say two practices. Um, one is just being a sponge. From every job that I've had, I am never afraid to ask questions and never afraid to find out why. And um, even though I studied graphic design, really investigating um, how people make decisions and what leads them to the result that they have, whether it's graphic design or product design or UX design, um, really understanding people people's process and, and being a sponge and figuring out how that could help inform my own process. Um, is really a mindset that I have, uh, no matter like what level of seniority you're at, uh, whether you're a junior, whether you're a senior, you can always learn from someone on your team or or a colleague, uh, even if they're not on your team. So that's something that I really try to stay open to, uh, is learning from other people and just absorbing what they can um, share with me. And then the second mindset is really setting um, goals for yourself. Uh, you know, even as a junior designer, when I, or an intern, when I had that first job, I had a couple goals. I wanted to try working at an agency. I wanted to try working on uh, different clients. Um, then I went in house and I was working on one thing. So really like trying to set some goals for yourself that you can work towards can help you focus where you want to uh, take your career or take your path. Um, and like trying to align yourself with, uh, you know, is there a mentor in my network? Is there someone in my community that I can connect with who's doing this work? Maybe they can find out more. Um, you know, that is kind of just the mindset that I have of always seeking and trying to find information um, and learn from it to help guide where I think I want to go. And sometimes you just don't know. You don't know if you have a goal, you don't know where you want to go, but, you know, you have to be as okay with that as you are with having a goal too. So um, that would be the two practices that I try to uh, keep in mind as I build my career over time. That's so great. So be a sponge and be aware of your goals, like be reflective of your goals. You know, if totally. it isn't something that you might have at the, at the beginning, then, you know, have a goal to have goals, 
you know, I think that that's a good, a good mindset to have. Uh, Louise, I was wondering if you would also like to uh, add to this conversation. I sure do. Um, yeah, I think this is a great question. I, I agree. Um, I think that a big, a big part of design work is acknowledging that the work is hard and no one knows what they're doing and it is an emerging discipline and it's in a field that you know is extremely fast paced and can be really really challenging um and so i think staying aware of that and being really compassionate for yourself and people around you is a really really important part um the key part of the job is breaking problems down to smaller chunks and how people see you do that work will be how your career grows and so I think staying compassionate to how everyone is getting by, how everyone's solving the problems, how everyone's contextualizing the work they're doing, and then working within that, like I'm a compassionate person and I can solve problems and so on and so forth, and explaining that to people, letting people see how you work, you know, show your work. Like I think that this is the most important part of design careers is just like acknowledging the work is hard and that like you're doing the, the like the best that you can and you are the unique person to solve this problem. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, so it's about like that intention and 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 then demonstrating like your intent and, and understanding the process associated with it. No, I think that that's fantastic. And then just make, let it be known to the folks around you, like the work that you are putting in, the work that is being done. Uh, so like respect for the work. Um, all right, so with that, we're gonna move on to the next question. Uh, the next question, we are going to look, uh, uh, Laura, I'm gonna look to you to be the first one to answer this one. Um, so thinking about the misconceptions that may exist for junior folks uh, getting into their, their careers uh, and at the beginning of their career path. So like, what are these misconceptions that exist for them? Yeah. Um, I think this really piggybacks off of uh, Louise's previous point. I think it more or less exists for like the junior folks to the junior folks. You kind of go into these jobs and you think that everybody is an expert. You think they know literally design from the beginning to the end, from the front to the back. And it really like gets into your head. And it, I know for me, I'm um, coming in as a person, like this is my first real design role. Um, and the only previous experience I had had was like as an intern and then I was a teacher. So I'm, I have a whole bunch of layers of imposter on me. And I think a lot of times that like stifles your voice and it stifles the interesting perspective that you have. And it stifles the way that you think and design because you don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to ask too many questions. You want people to take you serious. You just have all these things happening in your mind. And then you ultimately turn into an active imposter where you're like, still pretending that you know these things and it's kind of like active because now you think that these things are true so I would say like imposter syndrome and pretending like everyone is a genius around you are some of the major um, misconceptions but I think to battle it is to sometimes you kind of have to like physically put your feet like on the ground and understand that you're here for a reason and that you're in this space for a reason and that you're giving these perspectives for a reason and it might be revealed in a way that you don't know for me personally it was I looked at a list of artists that we were going to test and I said I don't listen to them and I feel like this doesn't reflect not even just the genres I listen to, but it doesn't reflect the multi pot and the multicultural audiences that we want to um, approach for this type of experience. So just understanding that like you are here for a reason, you do have a seat at the table because they know that you're going to provide a hearty meal when necessary. And um, just don't let your brain, like I, I hate the word mind over matter, the phrase mind over matter, but like don't let your brain trick you into thinking that the space and your perspective wasn't um, necessary and essential. So I think that's a good one. Yeah, like, you know, you're here for a reason. People want you here, like include your voice. And I, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned, like, don't go from being like, almost like fake imposter to real imposter. So don't let all of the hype around you make you feel like you have to put on a front you know, um, and still kind of take the time to like assert your point of view. Um, I love that. I think that is a fantastic uh, viewpoint in thinking about that. So uh, next, uh, Anna, I would love to hear uh, what you think. I think um, one misconception that I had early on is that like in order to have a successful career in design, I had to have that like perfect high profile job, like right off the bat. 
And I remember like coming out of, I went to design school and coming out of design school feeling this like immense pressure, um, you know, to have this like really creative, amazing job just because I had like so much passion for design. And that was like really contrasted with the fact that the industry is super competitive and everyone is passionate. Um, and there are a lot of people vying for these jobs. And um, I think that like, it's worth kind of noting that a lot of people on this panel, we didn't start our careers in a super glamorous position. It took a lot of years to um, really find our niche and figure out what we're good at. Um, and so I guess like my advice would just be like, your career lasts decades. You're gonna be doing this until you're like 65 years old. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of time to, to like grow and pivot and meet people who are gonna help you in your career along the way. Um, so it's gonna be fine. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's so funny how you were saying that the, your career lasts decades. Like I'm, I'm turning 40 soon and I was realizing that I'm not even halfway through like my career journey. So um, yeah, you got time. You got time to figure it out. You got some time to breathe and, 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 and reflect and, and change. So I, it, I appreciate hearing that. I appreciate you. Um, we're going to move on to our next question. So um, this question, Heather, I'm going to give you the heads up that, that I have you on deck for this question. You're the person that I have in mind. So networking helps build careers. Um, but also it, it, it can change from person to person, like what networking means. Everybody's different. Uh, so I'd like to know what networking means for you. Sure. Um, I'll just say right off the bat that I have never been good at networking. Even in like previous work when I was working in film, like you have to network a lot if you want to get jobs. And I was not good at that. And I think what I learned, you know, when I started doing product design, I actually learned this like when I was in grad school is that the best connections are the, they just come out of the sort of personal relationships that you build with people, like genuine relationships that you build with people. And so I had really amazing rapport with a couple of my professors and one of my professors, you know, without telling me, recommended me for this Kleiner Perkins program. And um, because they had recommended me and they knew the person in the program, they allowed me to submit my application like a day late and I ended up getting into the program. Um, and that was what I think sort of like kicked off my career, if you will, because that's how I landed my first job. And then, as I mentioned before, like I had a really amazing, um, first manager and mentor, uh, Dave, who, you know, hired me into the, into that job at clout. And, um, and he was just, um, you know, I built like a genuine, you know, relationship with this person, just, he became a friend. And it led to getting my next job, which he hired me at the, the next gig that we had after Cloud got acquired. And then he invited me to teach uh, at Stanford. And so these things just kind of snowball. And a lot of the people that, um, you know, a handful of them, not a lot, you know, two or three of the people that I worked with at Cloud, I still have a relationship with and we text each other. And it doesn't have to mean, you know, that, um, that you're caught up on there every day and that you talk on the phone, you know, once a month and all that stuff. Cause I definitely do not, but you know, I had, I built a friendship with them enough while I was at, at uh, clout and I, and I had a vested interest in who they were as, as people. We understood each other. We liked working together. We, we liked each other's work. Um, and so we've kept in touch and I, and I'm genuinely interested in where they are now. I, I want to work with them again, if given the opportunity. And that's a, that's a mutual, um, that's a mutual, uh, feeling like we would all happily work together and you'll naturally find these people. You'll naturally make these kinds of friendships while you're working. And so, you know, I mean, the flip side is true. Like I've had, I've been paired up with mentors, um, that it just didn't work out. Like we went and we got a coffee and, you know, we didn't vibe and it felt forced. And I, you know, I think again, it was mutual. Like we, we didn't force that connection. We didn't try to stay in touch. It was like, you'll find your people along the way. Um, and so I think that that I think has been the most powerful thing. It's how I've gotten every job I've held actually is, is through these relationships with people that I, that I really like and, and care for. Um, and so I think you'll find your way. Um, I don't think it has to be forced. Um, and I think the best connections aren't uh, typically forced. So don't be hard on yourself if you're like, I'm not doing enough networking. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's all about finding finding your people, finding them on the way. Uh, Becca, I was wondering if you had anything to, to add to that as well. 
Yeah, I really wanted to just plus one everything that Heather said. Um, you know, my pro, like, I agree. I also hate the word networking. I said, I think someone said that. Um, and I don't, I think there's just generally a misconception about networking that like, you're going to go to this mixer and then someone's going to see you and be like, wow, you're a great designer. Here's a job. Um, and that's really not how it works. You know, um, I don't think about networking as like something that I go to with intention to get a job or meet a specific person, but I, I show up in communities to really like be a part of them. And so, you know, I try, I am the co-founder of a community myself, um, for a design club, we are an online community for designers to meet each other. And that's kind of like a place where people come together and you can talk to each other. Like Heather said, it's really about building genuine relationships that over time as people, other people grow in their career and their own path that you cross paths. And sometimes it's beautiful and amazing. And you get to have lifelong uh, friendships with people over like, you know, really being invested in them as people, as Heather said, um, but really like not going to it with a, with a selfish intention of like, I only want to be friends with this person because like they have a really great job and they can get me a really great job. I want to get a job at Google. So I'm going to go add all of the Google managers on LinkedIn and I'm going to network with them. Like that's, that approach just doesn't work. You know, like instead I would join a community and if there is a person at Google there and I want to start working with them, I might say, Hey, you know, I would love to get a coffee with you sometime. I'd love to learn about you, your career path, how you got to Google. I'd like to learn about that. So, you know, behind the titles and behind the jobs and behind all the aspiration are people. Um, just like you and me who are learning, who are on a path or on a journey, everyone everyone who is a boss has a boss. So it's it's kind of just like a thing that you have to, you know, change your mindset of what is networking and how you show up in a space to meet other humans that are also interested in design, so. That's amazing. I, I, I love it, yeah. Like, it's really all about the the, the community and like, if, you know, sometimes you have to build the community if, if it doesn't exist for you, you know? Um, all right, so with that, I know we're running a little bit short on, on time. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna hand it over to Alex. Um, I know that we have some questions uh, from the audience and we're gonna open it up uh, to the panelists. Alex, are you there? I sure am. Hey, Mickey, and hi, everyone. I feel like I'm scribbling down my own notes as you're speaking, and I feel like I just got like 15 pep talks ready to conquer the world. Um, and while we were chatting, we got tons of questions from folks that are tuning in. And the first question um, is actually on the topic of mentorship. Um, somebody asks, where do you recommend finding mentors? I think a few people mentioned it, but um, there is a website called adplist.org uh, and adplist I know has in hundreds of incredible mentors across the design community and all different verticals that are ready to show up and open a door for you. So I would start with adplist. Um, I think also, you know, kind of what we just said about finding a community and sometimes finding a mentor just comes naturally. You click with someone, you realize they have kind of similar experience, they may be doing a thing you want to be doing and you just say, hey, like, want to get a coffee every couple of weeks and talk about design and you kind of fall into a mentorship sometimes. Um, but I would definitely start with with ADP lists. Yeah, I want to add to that as well. Like, there's no designer I know who wouldn't be flattered if someone reached out and asked them for a portfolio review. Like, it's a very short and easy thing to do. And it's lovely to see someone else's work. And so a really good way to open that door, if you are interested in a designer being your mentor or a person who needs to be your mentor, is just to ask them if they would take like 20 minutes of their day to take a look at your work. Um, there's no commitment there, you know, it's really easy. And then as I think Heather pointed out, it's not necessarily a match. So it's nice to just like have the opportunity to see what someone is like, and then it's non-committal. You can sort of work out if you want to keep chatting to them or if they want to keep chatting to you. Those are great points. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the next question because we got so many. Um, what do you do when you run out of creativity and how do you deal with the feeling of being a designer and kind of feeling down that you don't have new ideas to contribute to your design team? I think uh, for me, that's really common because writer's block. <laughs> 
Um, but I think one of the main things that I kind of do to help with that is find other outlets or like ensuring that I do have other outlets um, to kind of balance off some of these thoughts. So like I always read fiction. Um, my therapist one told me that fiction is a form of therapy, but it also is a form of like brain exercise because you have an anticipation of what will happen after the climax. You don't know about these characters. You're developing relationships with them. So it's like your brain is constantly working. I think. Um, one thing that I used to do a lot was I would take competitive screens. Um, so I would do like if I was an Apple, like if my friend used Apple Music, I would go in there and like rip the things to shreds <laughs> um, just to kind of like keep my competitive edge up, which would make me think of new things to do um, on Spotify. So I would say one of the main things that I did was always or that I still do is always ensure that I have other creative outlets to kind of balance off. Um, not feeling like I have to give a hundred of my like creative brain to the work that I'm putting out or the designs I'm creating. I also feel like stepping away from the work helps a lot. Um, I get a lot of inspiration just from my friends because they're great. They're funny. Like, you know, especially my designer friends the uh, that I have worked with in the past or, or even just like friends that I know who are in the field as well and bouncing ideas off of them. I think just stepping back and, um, and just, you know, those things, sometimes they come to you in the shower, you know, <laughs> it's like, don't overthink it, just take a break. Um, and I also personally find that like getting out from behind the screen specifically. So like thinking on paper, I think has uh, unblocked me on many occasions where just like sitting in front of my screen, like figuring out which pixels to push has not um, helped guide me in how to think about a problem. I think it's it's easy to design something once you sort of know how you're going to approach it or tackle it, but like knowing how to start is often really hard to, to do when you're looking at a blank screen. And I saw you unmute too. So I'd love to hear anything you have to say before we move on. Oh, yeah, I threw it in the chat. I think it's really similar to what Heather said, like just having a creative outlet away from the computer. I'm really into gardening and sewing. Also, just like petting my dog is cool. That makes me feel good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And I feel feel the same way. Um, and I love that somebody put in the chat, uh, touch grass. I needed that reminder. Um, okay, next question is kind of flipping, flipping our path a little bit. Um, this person wants to know, what's a mistake or a misstep you made early on in your career? And how would you advise designers to avoid it? I, I can, I can sort of feel this one a little bit. Um, I think as a junior designer, there is some pressure to bring big ideas. Like you put pressure on yourself to be a smart person in the room. And that can hurt you a little bit because you, as a sort of like more junior person, sometimes you lack context or sometimes you are underconfident or sometimes it's just not the, the right moment and you don't understand the system fully. And I think there were a couple of times that I shot myself in the foot by being like, oh my, I have to really like show up here and be a really big voice. And letting myself just like work more gradually with like the work that I was doing and just kind of like over time, but like increase my expertise and my confidence, I think really helped. I think not having to like show off and like show up in a big way all the time is actually kind of important um, because yeah, you, you, you don't need to, you, you can really just be really good at doing the fundamentals of the work and not the big idea person. And that comes over time. Like, don't put that pressure on yourself. Yeah, I would like to add really quick. I don't want to call it a misstep, um, but I will say that it did more personal harm than it did good. So one thing that I want to make sure that it is noted in design in general, um, and what's really passionate to me, I'm very passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and seeing myself in the teams that I'm on. And um, one thing I really noted about design just in general is there aren't a lot of people that look like me and there especially aren't a lot of people that look like me in the role that I do. So um, I came in and I was ready to just turn stuff upside down. I did like a diversity podcast. I was in a program, which I'm actually very proud of, that helped um, partner designers with aspiring designers and everything was great, but I also had a day job that I had to figure out how to balance um, with my brain. And I ultimately like burned out like 
very hard. So I don't want to call it a misstep, but I want to make sure that we note that like you can be an advocate and you can be an advocate for all the identities that show up there, but like find a balance between the two where you you don't feel like you're pulled in two directions. Um, because I was such an advocate so early on when things happened that might affect my mental health, it, ha it hit me even harder than it would usually do. Because I was thinking about not only how I could be better, but how I could make the people who weren't here better and how I could make the people who already are here even better. It just became a cycle that just wasn't healthy. So not a misstep, but just taking more care of my mental health, especially when it came up to how my identity showed up in design. Anyone else want to hop in on that one? And Laura, if you ever want to become a life coach, you have your first customer right here. Okay. I actually have a question I want to close this out with that I'd love each of our panelists to jump in on, um, including you, Miggy. I want to hear what you think too. If you could tell early career design folks to take one action after this session to advance or plan for their career, what would you recommend that action being? I can, Do you want uh, me to go? Oh, yeah, I was no, like, I can kick us off. <laughs> um, um, go ahead, Maggie. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I I would say that uh, just just take a step back. You know, look look with, with where you are. Look what you've done. You've you probably accomplished so much already. You know, you are you're 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 here. You know, you're you're, you're finding space. You're you're looking for community. So just 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 be proud of of where you are. Like, don't dismiss that outright. Yeah, um, I was just gonna say very tactically, uh, one thing that I think I didn't uh, realize quite as much as a student is that there are quite there are quite a, a lot of doors open to you as a student. So if you are a student um, or you're newly graduated. Um, internships, fellowship programs, those kinds of things are open to you um, at this moment, and then they close soon after. So a lot of those things are not available to you when you are actually working or you're out of school. And so in hindsight, I wish I had done more internships and exposed myself to more things. Um, I did do a fellowship, thank goodness. Um, but uh, do some research, look, look around for those things, see if there are, are opportunities that you can jump at, um, while you're in this stage, um, because there are, there are many more doors open to you now than I think there will be shortly, shortly after. Um, mine is also kind of silly and tactical, but I think if I was to recommend taking one action after this, it would be to like, go get in Figma and design something that you think is totally awesome. Um, design is like a really fun career. Like it's so fun. Um, and I, I'm a hiring manager and like, there's nothing that I love more than like seeing a portfolio, especially someone who's earlier in, early in their career. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. And you can tell that they really, really like designing this. Um, so that's what I would recommend that you do after this. I think I have two things that I would suggest. One is like, get take a reality check, like be really honest with yourself about how hard it is to get hired right now. And you're, you're doing everything you can, like you're really working and this is a tough environment. My other suggestion is to like, take a moment and consider making a little project and, and don't burn yourself out doing it. Don't, you know, don't push yourself, but try making something that you really enjoy making and try and fall back in love with the work because like, the industry is always going to go through these cycles of it is harder to get hired and then suddenly it's a it's a growth period and there's loads and loads of jobs but like your passion for the work will carry you through and people will see that and like it that is the one thing you can come back to is like i enjoy the work don't don't burn yourself out but like keep keep the passion like that's what my recommendation would be so mine is definitely going to piggyback off of what Louise said. Uh, I was going to say that to be patient, you know, like it takes a while. It takes a while to get your first job. It takes a while to get your foot in the door, um, but be patient and like take it easy on yourself. Like I think that there's often a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of like harsh feelings that come with like getting feedback from people, getting job rejections or something. Um, and it's all part of the process. Like if you're going to be a designer, you're going to have to 
ex- be cool with feedback at some point in your life, be cool with getting rejected at some point in your life. I think those are things that just like, you know, life things, it, it's hard, but it will like benefit you in the long run to get comfy with it and get comfortable with being uncomfortable in those situations. Um, and then lastly, I was going to say, join a community, go out there and make friends in design. I think like, you know, Figma really unlocks collaboration. Go design something with a friend, go make a, per- go meet someone, join a community, um, talk to people and really like just be be a sponge and be present in the world of design with other people. I think that's one of the beauties of being online, being remote, being hybrid. Um, you get to meet people that you would never meet in your geographical presence. So um, learn from that. Yeah. And then I'll like close the section. Everybody has said everything, but I think physically like un clench your jaw, relax your shoulders. Sorry about the vacuum. They're doing something in my hallway, but like relax. I think this time of your career always feels like something is like on your chest because you're trying to make the move to like breathe in and breathe out about it. Um, And then like in a more tactical thing that you can do is like write that one special LinkedIn message that is not asking for a job particularly, but it's asking about what that person does. It's asking about how they got here. It's talking to him about their journey. I would have never ended up back at Spotify as a copywriter on podcast editorial if I didn't like replay the credits on a podcast and then go message everybody on LinkedIn. Like, hi, I just want to talk to you about what you do. So like, don't be afraid to make that one step where it's a very genuine and intentional message to just really talk to a person about how they got here. What were the ups and the downs? Have a really honest conversation and um, just understand the workings of the person behind the craft. Oh, can I, can I provide one more? You, yes, you know, y'all maybe go me. for it. Another tactical one. Y'all inspired me. Uh, it was based off actually to a conversation that I was having in working on your portfolio, create smaller tasks, like, you know, just rewrite one post, re, re, rework one thing at a time. Oftentimes, if you look at your portfolio as this like big, you know, scary monster, then you're not going to want to work on it. And it's harder to deal with, you know, and sometimes really just need to rework just one project to get noticed. So if you are getting rejections or you're getting feedback, you know, um, don't feel like you have to scorch the earth, you know, work on it piece by piece, get feedback from, from, from other folks and, and see what resonates and tell the story. And when you're excited about a story, it'll resonate. And those are the things that you want to surface to the top. So in showing your work, you know, uh, take it in small chunks and, and, and surface what excites you. Maybe I don't think I could have closed this out in any better way. Y'all, I'm feeling so inspired. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here today, for investing in the, the next generation of designers. And I just want to say, as you think about networking, connecting with other people, each of this each of these panelists are here today because they had a friend of a friend, or they worked at a company with somebody from Figma who is really passionate about this career series. So go out there, make the connections, and thank you so much all for spending your time with us today. It was so generous.